Fantastic. Good morning, everyone. Uh, lovely uh, to see you this morning. A couple of years ago, uh, Catherine and I really got into this show. Has anybody seen it? Ben Fogel's New Lives in the Wild. Anybody seen it? Just a few th- people. Well, essentially, in each episode, Ben Fogel, look at him there. What a man. Oh, what a man. We all aspire to be like Ben Fogel. Well, I do anyway. He would visit an individual, maybe a couple or a family, who had decided to leave mainstream Western civilization to move to some remote and desolate part of the world to embrace a wild life, often without modern amenities. And in every episode, Ben would go and immerse himself in the lives of these people. He would explore their motivations, their highs and lows of living, often in really harsh environments. Now, Catherine and I loved it. In each episode, we would be transported to a remote island off the coast of Scotland or to the middle of Alaska or to the Himalayan foothills in India, the deserts of Australia. And in nearly every episode, I would think something like this. I could do that. I could move there. I could live like that. Wouldn't it be brilliant to live more sustainably, to break away from our societal structures, and ultimately to move as far away from other people as possible? (laughs) Now, if you know me just a little bit, you will know that I am an introvert. Uh, And it seems like I'm getting more introverted as I get older. And I I love being with people, I love getting to know people and growing in relationships, but I do generally find it tiring. And so while I love the idea of heaven, I'm slightly concerned that there might be other people there. (laughs) So I found this. That's my dream of heaven there on the left. (laughs) That's my fear of what could be the reality. Okay, that's just a bit of a joke, right? I recognize that my introversion could actually be a dangerous and slippery slope to be ultimately becoming just a grumpy old man, growing older and never wanting to see anyone else. <laughs> However, I also recognize that while there is a place in God's kingdom, thank the Lord for extroverts and introverts, at the heart of the teaching of Jesus, and in fact the whole biblical narrative is the creation and the formation of a community of people who centre themselves around the life and the teaching of Jesus, who are essentially a community of full-time apprentices to Jesus. And even if you've just read a bit of the Gospels, they're the four uh, outlines of the life of Jesus in the Bible, even if you've just read a little bit, you will see that Jesus doesn't just ask his apprentices to enter into community maybe once a week or only part-time with only a part of their lives. No, Jesus asks for it all. People who do life together. And it's the picture that we definitely get from our passage that we heard from Acts that Joyce read to us. And though, although that passage there is definitely not a blueprint for what it means to be church, we do see what the values of a community centered around Jesus should look like. So if you were with us uh, last week, we started our three-week mini-series looking at our vision. You will remember that we spent a bit of time introducing our series. We talked about how it's a bit like an MOT But maybe more than that, we're hoping to explore the vision where we feel God is calling us in the next journey of our life together. We reminded ourselves of our vision as a church that we are a multi-generational family who follow Jesus, called by him to worship God, that's the up of our triangle, to grow together as a family of faith, that's our in, and to share his love with others, that's our out. We believe that we are called to be a church family so that, as we will explore more next week, we can be a blessing to families in our community. And as a church leadership, we feel that God is calling us to narrow the focus of our mission, and particularly our Blessed Greystones initiative, 
on supporting and equipping family life and relationships in this community. Last week, I suggested that as we are formed into his family, we must first know ourselves as adopted children of the Father. And it's from that place of knowing whose we are that we know who we are. It's from that place that we can fully enter into becoming part of the community of believers or the church family. And again, we touched on the pastoral sensitivities of using that word family. So I hope you hear those as we delve deeper this morning. So this morning we come to uh, this second corner of our triangle where we see in this incredible passage from Mark's Gospel... Jesus arguably talking about and suggesting one of the most controversial things in his teaching. So much so that some scholars suggest that Jesus' teaching on family was one of the primary reasons that Jesus was hated by the Jewish authorities who sought so hard to get him executed. So you might want to open that up. Uh, with me. We're on page 1160. Hopefully there is a Bible uh, in a, a pocket around you, 1160. It's just this short passage here at the end of Mark chapter 3. Mark's gospel, he speeds his way through the life of Jesus. And earlier in this chapter, we've already seen that Jesus is rocking the cultural bolt boat of first century Palestine. So for example, he's healed on the Sabbath, big no-no. He's forming a big crowd through his healings and miracles. He's appointed 12 disciples who are echoing back to the 12 tribes of Israel. He's been accused of being the prince of demons. But we see it's not just that the religious authorities who are trying to stop him but it's even his own family. So look down with me back on verse 21, the page before the one we're at. Verse 21 of chapter 3 says, When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. What we see very early on in Mark's Gospel is that this is far from Jesus, meek and mild, a friend to all. Jesus is already three chapters in, creating a lot of enemies, and even his family think he's gone mad. But arguably, what comes at the end of chapter 3 is even more controversial. As I touched on last week, in first century Middle Eastern culture, the most important societal, societal bonds were the relationship with your blood family and primarily your paternal father's family, so your family on your father's side. So communities were shaped around blood family relationships. And we know that Jesus, as the firstborn male in his family, particularly had huge responsibilities particularly now that his earthly father, Joseph, is no longer around. In first century Middle Eastern culture, and in fact, it's still the same in many cultures today, we see a strong group culture. It's what anthropologists call a strong group culture. And one anthropologist, uh, Bruce Molina, has defined it like this. The person perceives himself or herself to be a member of a group and responsible to the group for his or her actions, destiny, career, development, and life in general. The individual person is embedded in the group and is free to do what he or she feels right and necessary only if in accord with group norms and only if the action is in the group's best interest. The group has priority over the individual member and it may use the members of the group to facilitate group-orientated goals and objectives. So this is a, a working definition of what it means to have a strong group culture. And most anthropologists reckon that here in the West, uh, we live in a weak group culture, a weak 
uh, group culture. So back to the New Testament, the closest generational family bond was not the bonds actually of marriage, but of siblings. Correspondingly, the most treacherous act of human disloyalty in an ancient family was not, in fact, disloyalty to one's spouse. It was betrayal of a sibling. So we're starting to see just how controversial it is what Jesus is saying here. Jesus said that his greatest relational bonds were not his blood relatives, his mother and his brothers, but as we see in verse 35, anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. And as he says this, he literally looks to those around, really, around him, the, the inner circle of his followers. And these are the followers that he's just formed in the earlier part of the chapter. So Jesus is blowing wide open not only the familial bonds, but also the ethnic bonds embedded in society at the time. And it's why Paul picks up on this language when he says that there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female. He says, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So Jesus' vision of this new community is multi-ethnic. It's of every tribe and language. It's every race and culture. Jesus here uses the Greek word adelphos to talk about brothers and sisters, what's translated here as brothers and sisters. And that word adelphos is the most common word used to describe the followers of Jesus in the New Testament. In fact, it's used over 300 times. So Jesus, what he's doing here, is he's taking the language of the strongest relational bond at the time between blood siblings, and he's using it now for the relationship between his new community. And in doing this, he's not questioning the strong group structure of society at the time, but he's saying that you have to make his group, essentially, your primary group. And this is wildly at odds with our individualistic culture here in the West. John Mark Comer, who you know I love and listen to lots of his work and read his books, he um, rewrote the definition of a strong group culture, and he swaps the word group with the word church. And as I'm going to read this out, I just want you to respond to what your heart is saying to you as I read this out now. Just hear what your heart is saying. The person perceives himself or herself to be a member of the church and responsible to the church for his or her actions, destiny, career, development, and life in general. The individual person is embedded in the church and is free to do what he or she feels right and necessary only if in accord with church norms and only if the action is in the church's best interest. The church has priority over the individual member and it may use the members of the church to facilitate church-orientated goals and objectives. Now, some of you might be freaking out about this. Again, ready to bolt for the door. And I just want to say, I don't want you to feel guilty. There is no shame here. But I want you to hear how your heart responds to this. Don't worry if it feels completely at odds with your way of being. That is the same for me. And I want you to see how, just how powerful our individualistic culture is and how much of the messaging of our culture speaks so much against something like this. There are, however, some narratives, some stories in our culture that tell a different story. This week, uh, Catherine and I finished the fifth and final series of the BBC comedy Ghosts. 
Anybody seen it? Okay, you've got to watch it. It's absolutely brilliant. Five series. They have just finished the fifth and final series. Now, if you don't know this premise, Ghosts is about a young couple there at the bottom uh, who inherit a huge old house in the countryside. And after surviving falling from a top window, the wife, that's Alison at the bottom there, she discovers that she can communicate and see this group of ghosts, people who have, over thousands of years, died, but their ghosts remain. And what's so brilliant about the show is the eclectic group of ghosts brought together by their shared inability to go on to the next life. Not only that, but within the premises of the show at least, being ghosts, they can't leave the house or the grounds where they died. They're literally stuck together for seeming eternity. So for example, amongst some of the characters, there's an Edwardian lady There's a a World War II army captain. There's a a scout leader from the 1960s killed by an arrow by a younger member of his group. There's Robin, great character, who's essentially a 10,000-year-old caveman. And Mary, a 17th-century peasant woman who died at the stake. The only thing that this group of ghosts have in common is that they are all ghosts. They're all stuck in this house waiting for their moment to leave. Now, I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but the final episode includes this line. This is Alison speaking, and she says this, you are awful, referring to the ghosts, but what are you going to do? It's family. What makes ghosts so charming and so heartwarming is this incredibly eclectic group are essentially forced to exist together, but amazingly, they don't just exist. In fact, they become family. So much so that the one couple who can leave, and they are given options and opportunities to leave throughout the series, they want to remain as part of this family. So stick with me here. I hope you are hearing some of the beautiful parallels with the church. And I think Ghosts is so appealing because it speaks deep into that part of the human DNA that is made for relationship and community, that is made to flourish and to thrive, not alone, but with others, to do life together. And let me remind you that I say all of this as an introvert, still wondering which remote, desolate place of the world I'm going to be called to go off to into the wild, and of course, waiting for Ben Fogel to come. So this morning, this challenges and speaks to me just as much as anyone else. Jesus' vision for church is that of a family. It's not a building, not an event on Sunday, or a gathering three or four hours a week. Jesus' vision is so much more than this. It's a vision of a church that does life together, a church family that eat together regularly, a church family that hold each other account, that share resources and responsibilities, that bear one another's burdens, a church family that are quick to say sorry and quick to forgive. They make decisions together. A church family that releases each other into God's call on their life. A church family that is faithful to each other, even when they hurt one another. Again, there is no shame here. But I want you to respond to what your heart might be saying this morning to you. And particularly where the spirit might be challenging you. Family should be a place of deepest hurt and deepest healing, a place of celebration. So, for example, when did you last ask a member of your church to look at your monthly budget and how you spend your money? When did you last ask a member of the church for advice on how you parent or how to be a better grandparent? When did you last ask a member of the church what might be the job that God is calling you into or how you might volunteer? 
When did you last gather with other members of the church family to celebrate something together, to have a party? But also, when did you last cry with a member of the church family? Let's be clear. I am all too aware of the immense pressures on our lives. Time pressures, financial pressures, the challenges of health. And Alistair, maybe 10 years younger, may have simply taken that passage from Acts and told us that this is the church that we have to be. But I've been deeply wrestling with how to actually make this vision of the family that Jesus calls us into, how to make it possible. How do we do that when some of us are working maybe in a school setting where the demands of time and energy seem to be getting more and more? How do we do that working for the NHS where pay doesn't increase at a sustainable level but the hours get longer and harder? How do we do that as a grandparent offering travelling to other parts of the country, sometimes looking after elderly parents but also grandchildren? How do we do that when we're maybe struggling with loneliness and we find it increasingly difficult to build relationships? How do we do that with a long-term health condition that often means it's a real struggle to leave the house. How do we do that when mortgage payments, they've just gone up, and actually our spouse needs to increase their hours. We need to work more to be able to stay financially stable. How do you do that when it seems like every evening you drive from one club to the next, desperately trying to give your children all the opportunities they deserve? Of course, I could go on. And I am all too aware of the demands of life. So what does it look like? What does it look like to be this church family that I think God is calling us into? I don't have any silver bullets, some fantastic answers that I can share with you. But I wanted to just challenge you with one thing this morning. For me, where where it comes down to, at the very base level of how we outwork this being a church family, I want to suggest this. Where is the place for you where you work your stuff out with another follower of Jesus? The stuff of life, the highs, the lows. Where do you go or to whom do you go to be vulnerable, to pray, to ask God what he might be saying into the everyday things of life. In churchy language, where do you go to help you grow as a disciple? Where is that place for you? And here at St. Gabriel's, that could look different for different people. Yes, we have growth groups. They are one way. They usually meet on an evening, although we have a daytime group. They're one place where this can be worked out. But that might not be practical for you. But it might be more practical to gather with one or two others to try and integrate that within some of the difficulties of life, within some of the time pressures, within some of the things that you do. Where is that place for you that you are working out the stuff of life with another or maybe other disciples of Jesus? And that is my challenge, my encouragement to you today. And if you're not a part of anything like that, whether it's in this church or maybe somewhere else, please do come and speak to myself, to Pete, to another member of the ministry leadership team. We'd love to help you to find where that place might be for you. Now to close, I want to just spend a few moments practicing this together. Practicing what it means uh, to be vulnerable. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is, again, this is only if you feel willing to do this, uh, to turn to the person next to you. Now, if you are feeling uh, extra, uh, uh, like you want to push yourself a bit, you can find somebody that you didn't come with. So maybe not uh, your partner or your spouse uh, or a member of your family. You can go and find someone else. But whatever you feel comfortable, if you'd like to, I want you to simply share two things with the person next to you. Firstly, very simply, what are you thankful for today? What do you want to give thanks 
for today? And secondly, what would you like prayer for? Now, I want you to try really hard not to try and think of something for someone else, because I know a lot of us do that, and that is absolutely right. We ask for prayer, and it's usually because our hearts are for someone else, and we're, we have that. But I want to think about something for you. What do you need prayer for, for your own life? It could be your health. It could be your job situation. Uh, it could be something that you're going through. What do you need prayer for? And just to share that with the other person. And then, if you're willing, to pray for one another. Now, I want you to just practice one phrase with me very quickly. Uh, this phrase is very simple. I would prefer not to pray out loud. Just say with that with me. I would prefer not to pray out. If that's you, that's absolutely fine. Just say that to the person next to you. I'd prefer not to pray out loud. Or the alternative is, I'm happy to pray out loud. I'm happy to, yeah, okay. You get the idea. You don't have to pray out loud if you don't want to. I know that is uncomfortable. You could simply just say the thing to the person next to you, and then you could just be in quiet for a few moments. Does that make sense? We're going to be really quick here, just a couple of minutes, but we're just going to tra- practice being vulnerable, appropriately vulnerable, go as far as you are willing uh, with the person next to you, and then we will continue by singing together. Is that all right? Two minutes. Give it a go. <laughs>